Cool, so thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to start today's talk with two stories, two very different stories. First story is called The Stonecutter. And I'd like you to cast your minds back to ancient China. And the hero of our story is a stonecutter. He's a very poor man. He spends his days chipping away at blocks of stone uh, beside quite a busy road. He's not a very happy man. Not very uh, kind of content with his lot. And one day he's chipping away at the stone and he sees a big procession walking by. And there's an emperor, a very important official, he's being carried in this litter. And the stonecutter looks up and he goes, Oh man, if I were that guy, that would be, that's all I would need. That would just be absolutely amazing. And suddenly, magically, he becomes the official. And the next thing he knows, he's sitting on the litter and you know, the sun's beating down, everyone's bowing down to him. And you know, people are like carrying him around, and he's thinking, yeah, this is, this is the life. I've made it now. This is exactly what I wanted. Then he starts to get a little bit sticky and hot. And he notices, he looks around, and he notices that the sun is shining down on everybody. Everyone's wearing hats. Everyone's kind of finding the shades, hottest time of the day. And he thinks, actually, no, no. The most powerful I could possibly be is to be the sun. And so magically, he transforms, and he becomes the sun. And he's burning down on things, um, you know, making the, the, uh, the plants grow. And he thinks, right, this is it. Now I'm the most powerful I could possibly be. And then suddenly a cloud just drifts over the landscape and blocks out the sun. And he goes, oh, no, no I'm not having any of that. Just being the sun is shit. I'm going to be a cloud. Bam, magically, he becomes a cloud. And he's raining down on people. And he's blocking out the sun. And it's just, it, for a while, it's amazing. It's great. He's like, oh, this is, this is the ultimate, ultimate experience. I'm as powerful as I could possibly be. And then he notices he's being pushed back and forth. Doesn't really have any control over it. And he realizes that the wind is more powerful than the cloud, because the wind can send the cloud anywhere it wants. So, of course, magically, he becomes the wind. And he's blowing around. People's hats are being blown off. People are kind of finding shelter. He's like, ah, eh, this is it. Now I'm the wind. The sun doesn't make a difference. Clouds don't make a difference. He's always the wind. And so he smacks into something so huge you can't possibly blow it over. And he notices there's a huge mountain. And he goes, right, mountain, that's it. Sun beats down on it. The wind hits it. Rains on, you know, it gets rained on constantly. It is pretty immovable and unchanging. So he becomes the mountain. And for ages, it's just the best being the mountain. Everyone looks up at him in the distance. He's huge, powerful. And then one day, he hears this very, very gentle sound. Of chick, chick, chick. And he looks down himself, and there's a tiny stone cutter chipping away at the bottom of the mountain. The story can go two ways. He could say, oh, I finally see you know, where my error was. But in the story, the way I read it, there was, that's just where it ended in, in typical kind of Zen type fashion. So bear that in mind, that guy's journey. I'm going to tell you about another story, much more recent about a man, he's a down and out writer, living in a contemporary city in America. His girlfriend thinks he's a bit of a loser. No one's publishing his stuff. And a friend comes up to him and goes, look, I've got this drug, really, <laughs> really powerful drug. It's going to make you smarter, faster, better. Takes the drug, and lo and behold, it works. He eventually gets a job in, uh, as a stockbroker. He makes loads of money. He's becoming really powerful. He's getting all the women. But things start to go wrong. You know, the drug isn't all it seems. And he starts to kind of have a downward spiral. But then sort of inexplicably, at the end of the film, he uh, somehow starts producing the drug himself in his body and ends up becoming a senator. He gets all his stuff published. He kind of beats the bad guy. And he's like, yeah. And uh, he's Bradley Cooper. And he's, <laughs> he's limitless. So those are two very, very different approaches to life and two diff very different messages. We have one message about the folly of following the ego blindly wherever it might lead us. And we have another one in which really the ego is the king here. You want to be limitless. L the pill makes you stronger, better, faster, more amazing than everyone. And in the film, there's, there's very little kind of examination of um, a kind of a deeper sense of spiritual connection. It's really just, yeah, you're the best. Well, let's go for it. And our culture is very much like that. So this talk is really about the nexus between those two ways of seeing and understanding. 
a lot of us have grown up in a culture in which the promises of a magic pill that makes us amazing, like Limitless, is what we have, in a sense, been pushed to strive towards. We're from a radically individualist culture where success and power and prestige and all of these very egoic qualities are held up very high. Go to school, do well in school, go to university, do well in university, get a good job, be better, smarter, faster, push, push, more, more. There are other cultures, for example, the culture that created the story about the stonemason, in which the ego is seen as much less important and in fact not real, not even real. It's an illusion. Now, I'm not going to side with either of these. Um, actually, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, so you know who I am. Um, my name is Alexander Beiner. I am a, uh, a meditation teacher. I teach non-religious mindfulness meditation. I'm also um, very interested in psychedelics. And my interest really is in phenomenology and uh, really how we navigate our own minds and especially about how to avoid the pitfalls, the spiritual and psycho-spiritual pitfalls that might come up when we're using psychedelics for personal growth or using meditation for personal growth. Um, that's really where my interest lies in, in psychedelics. Becoming, in a sense, not quite like limitless, but becoming more aware, wiser, more loving, compassionate, and stronger people. But there's a problem. Those two stories I mentioned, they present us with two extremely different ways we might approach that process of self-growth. And both of them are really present in lots of psychedelic literature, in psychedelia in general. There's a huge um, kind of wellspring of knowledge from the Eastern traditions, and very often, um, that is what we draw on. There's so many books written, um, there's so many approaches to psychedelics that are based in Eastern philosophy. Uh, and yet, not that many of us grew up in Eastern cultures where that philosophy was completely normalized. So, um, that's the most embarrassing picture there is of me in the world. <laughs> that's a picture of myself wearing this lovely lady, my fiance, Ashley's hair. <laughs> and the reason I put that picture up is to explain what the shadow is. Uh, the shadow, <laughs> the shadow is a bit misleading because the shadow's not quite the shadow. That was totally willing, I wanted that. Um, <laughs> the shadow is actually uh, the aspects of ourselves that we pretend aren't there. The dark side of our own personalities. The part of yourself when you're caring for a sick relative that secretly wishes and hopes they'll put you in their will. It's the part of yourself that judges a stranger when they walk onto the tube and is projecting out all the bits you don't like about yourself. It is all the things uh, that we will not accept that we have. Greed, anger, so many of them. It's an infinite. We all have different shadows. But crucially for me, uh, I'm very interested in how this blend between East and West has created within the psychedelic community potentially a new type of shadow, which I think is, is kind of unexamined, and it's something that I was raised a little bit at the last Bacon Convention, and what I want to talk about this time, because I find it really interesting, um, and important, actually, as well. So let's look a little bit at that East versus West dynamic, and just get a bit of a clearer idea of the kind of language and the kind of approaches that we see um, when we, say, read some philosophy or have conversations. So, my background, my meditation practice is very um, much Zen, Sazen, sitting meditation. I, a lot of um, insight and uh, connection has been um, gathered through the practice and study of Zen for me. This is one of my favorite. You might uh, have seen this story before. There's a um, poetry competition in a monastery. And this, is, this poetry competition, um, one of the entrants, who's quite a well-respected monk, he wrote, the body is the wisdom tree. The mind is a bright mirror in a stand. Take care to wipe it all the time and allow no dust to cling. So this idea of purifying our mind so that we're clean and that our, our kind of, in a sense, our egoic attachments and our preconceptions aren't clouding our vision of true reality. Very nice. However, the person who won that poetry competition became one of the patriarchs of Zen. And he was just a, um, basically he worked in the kitchens. He wasn't a monk. And he wrote, apparently, you know, the story goes different ways, but he apparently, like, a bit like Goodwill Hunting, you know, he just, like, tacked it up on the wall, and everyone was like, oh, 
He wrote, fundamentally no wisdom tree exists, nor the stand of a mirror bright. Since all is empty from the beginning, where can the dust alight? So you see this real depth of exploring what the ego is. And the first one, we have this idea that the ego is there, and you have to clean it, and you have to make it you know, pure. Hui Neng, in typical Zen fashion, said it's not there in the first place. The whole idea that you have an individual self is an illusion. So trying to polish it is only reinforcing that false boundary. So there is no mirror. There is nowhere for the dust to alight. This is the Zen concept of no mind. There's a lovely Zen saying, an image of a very still lake and geese flying over the lake. It says, the water has no memory to retain their image and the birds have no intention of casting it. This beautiful, beautiful, uh, lovely sense of emptiness and flow. But is that all there is? That's the question. And does that lovely sense of having no self and no mind how does that really apply to our day-to-day -day existence? And has there ever been a moment in a conversation you've had with someone, in your pursuit of love and happiness, that you have, you know, any of us, really just been nobody uh, at all? So that's why I want to go to look at... Um, I'll come back to that later. I want to look at the West. I want to look at some of the, the ways we contextualize ourselves. Um, this is a quote. I'll tell you who it is after you read it. Um, achievement of your happiness is the only moral purpose of your life, and that happiness, not pain or mindless self-indulgence, is the proof of your moral integrity, since it is the proof and the result of your loyalty to the achievements of your values. You cannot find a more ego-centered um, way of seeing our lives. It was written by a methamphetamine addict called Ayn Rand, uh, you might have heard of. <laughs> Um, and for me, she really is the perfect polar opposite to Zen. I always think it's a fascinating. And weirdly, there's a kind of a connection going on there too, but that's a whole topic for a whole other controversial talk some other time. <laughs> but this is interesting. Uh, so much of Western capitalist, kind of liberalist policy, Ayn Rand is basically their, their guru, right? That's the world that we are living in and trying to reconcile our experience in. So this is a real clash of two varying ideas. We might connect through our psychedelic usage with the sense that we have of dissolving and becoming one with everything, which is a, a genuine experience, which, which is the, for me, the peak you know, of the psychedelic experience in some ways. And yet, we still have hopes, dreams, desires we still want to achieve. We still want to, um, we are still kind of using our own cultural operating system even if we have managed to dissolve it in some way and adopt other cultural operating systems, uh, many of us are still uh, connected to individuality. It doesn't have to be the type of brash, Ayn Rand, kind of Nazism individuality, but individuality itself is a beautiful and very important thing. So it's all very well having no self, but what about the self? So those are two, for me, those are very much in conflict in my own practice and in my own life. And I, and, in what I see in just reading and talking to people. So one of the things that I think comes from this clash is um, uh, a lot of talking about bulls, uh, new age bullshit. <laughs> so new age bullshit is my least favorite thing in the world. And I think a lot of it stems from a, an attempt to reconcile the Eastern model with a quite ego-driven Western approach and try and blend the two together. I'm not sure if you've ever seen the New Age Bullshit Generator online. Show of hands? Yeah, yeah right. So I did a few before this. Um, so, so it's basically you just generate, you just click generate, and it gives you a randomized New Age Bullshit thing. So you know, this life is nothing short of a summoning source of astral learning. The goal of meridians is to plant the seeds of flow rather than turbulence. To walk the myths is to become one with it. It is in condensing that we are aligned. You can do hundreds of these, right? I mean, another one is, the universe is calling to you via ultrasonic energy. Can you hear it? <laughs> we can no longer to afford to live with the ego. I love that that came out, because that is this kind of sense of, no, no, we want to have no egos. But we're so uh, kind of uh, connected to our egos. So what can happen, potentially, is that we blend these things in a really messy way, and we might start to be someone we're not. I've certainly had this experience in my life, in my practice. We might be like a lemur. I just wanted to get a lemur in a suit in the talk, really. So it's kind of it's a great picture. We, we, bec <laughs> we become 
<laughs> someone we're not, clothed in a way we'd like to be, potentially. Um, and so what I'm interested in is how do we move towards wholeness, balance, and self-acceptance with this weird kind of joining of it? How do we find really the balance between these two things? And we come now to the point of the talk, really, the shadow. So, so much of this um, process, I think, of trying to move away from the ego and trying to make egoic impulses dark and bad and not spiritual and not advanced, and it uh, creates a shadow of many different aspects of ourselves. But for me, it almost creates a shadow out of the ego itself, which is bizarre. So uh, the potential is that we become so disconnected from our own urges that our, we can blind ourselves to our own individuality and our own kind of entire identity. And it's rare that it will happen to an extreme case, but I've seen it so many times in different places. Um, and I think it is a real phenomenon that happens in the psychedelic community. Um, so this is what happens if we can adopt purely Eastern models and try and stuff them into some kind of other framework. But at the same time, we don't want to go Ayn Rand and just go full ego. You never go full ego. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's sorely lacking. It's empty. It's robotic. It's blind. When you just have an ego that's not connected to the totality of being and everything else, and there's only you and nothing is more important than your individual process, you're basically Adolf Hitler. So you don't, you know, I mean, I don't, but you might, but <laughs> I certainly don't want that in my own practice, in my own life. So balance really becomes essential. And I think a, um, an integral model, I'm going to come back to that first, an integral approach is really important. So uh, quick show of hands, have you heard of the Integral Institute or Ken Wilber or any of his work? Yeah, so I find that quite a useful model. Um, in Ken Wilber's early work, he talked about the fact that you could see ourselves, you as a human being, on kind of a spectrum of consciousness, which is what this graph is called. So, and where, how whole and connected we are depends on where we draw the line between me and not me. What does mean, what does not me? So you might have a persona like the lemur, you know, I'm a man in a business suit, um, and then split off from the real true essence of himself that he's a lemur, for example. Um, you also might have a split between uh, the ego, the sense of my I-ness, and the body. You know, I might feel like I think a lot of us have or do sometimes that you're like a little controller controlling a body instead of feeling like a, a body mind, a whole body and mind connected in one moment. And so on and so forth. You might, uh, you know, break down those barriers and then be a whole body mind with a really healthy um, ego. But then I still feel separate to all of you guys in the chairs. And then there are various different processes, uh, for example, psychedelics or meditation we might go through and we might have an experience of I am you, you are me, um, you know, of unity and connection with everything. And that's the kind of uh, peak mystical experience of oneness. The crucial thing here, though, is that none of these levels are more or less important than other levels. So you can have a peak mystical experience but still have a massive unresolved split in your personality between, uh, between two different aspects of yourself. You could meditate for 50 years and still be homophobic. You know, that happens to plenty of monks who would be like that. So why, why is that? And how, what do we kind of do about that? Um, the crucial thing as well about these boundaries that split us from ourselves is that they are constructed. We make the boundaries up. They're not real. So they're a lot like the, the border between Mexico and America. That's it right there. It looks very real. It's, there's a, I've got a photo of it. It couldn't be more real, it seems. But of course, uh, in many ways, it's not real. It's something we, it's a model, it's an idea that we have made real. And when birds fly over the border, they don't stop to show their passports they, because it's not, it's not a physical border. We've made it up. But the barriers in ourselves can be just as real and be experienced as real as well. And to go back to what I was talking about, a barrier between being uh, a certain way and not having any kind of egoic attachments, that is a barrier that can be really forced in and maintained deeply unless we look at it. And the secret to uh, barrier dissolution 
is to look at the barriers. You remember the, the Hui Neng poem. He doesn't say, he says, don't polish the mirror. Simply realize that the mirror was never there in the first place. Like the kid in the matrix, there is no spoon. Um, and meditation, actually I'll talk about psychedelics first. For me, what psychedelics do, one of the things they do is force barrier dissolution really fast, whether you want it or not, which is a fantastic thing because we never want it. <laughs> so it needs to be forced sometimes. And they're incredible, you know, they're mind blowing and we feel connected and amazing. And then we go through a process where the barriers kind of reform. And we can, you know, a week later it could be at work and be like, I, I got it, I got it, I was there. Like every, everything made sense, but now all the barriers have reformed. So it's not quite enough, in my opinion, to do that. Um, likewise, meditation is this process of slowly paying attention to your boundaries and realizing through non-judgmental awareness that they're not real in the first place. It's a slow, gradual process. It's often called opening the hand of thought. You start to slowly open your grip on things, your attachments, your grip on yourself, on other things, until you realize that whatever you were holding onto so tightly, you're like, oh, I wonder what this is, and then you realize there was nothing there in the first place. And that's Sartori in the Zen tradition. It's like, ah, you laugh at yourself. That's, that's what's the funny thing about it. Um, that's the hand. Um, yeah, so I talked about those transpersonal bands at the bottom of the graph. You know, you can have, you can become one with everything, but becoming one with everything does not make you a better person. So very briefly, um, the model that I like to use firstly is called Trip Train Integrate, and it's in the book in your bags, uh, my article from last year. So I don't want to talk about it too much to use up time but a process of combining meditation and psychedelics together in a healthy, sustainable way um, to avoid some of those pitfalls. And the point is not to kind of become enlightened in that kind of classical Eastern sense, or to be the god and king of everything, like in kind of limitless or Ayn Rand type sense. But for me, it's more of a process of self-discovery and growing uh, ourselves, and what we're growing is our egos, I think, through these processes, through meditation and through a psychedelic experience, I'm not trying to get rid of the ego and be like, oh, I don't need this anymore, it's not real, so I don't want it. For me, the whole point is the ego. The whole point is to have a perspective outside of yourself, outside of your own ego, from which you can make a better ego, a healthier, happier, nicer, more connected, more compassionate ego that has taken its rightful place not as the king of everything, like the, the Abrahamic God, which is just a massive ego, um, but as a part of a flowing process and um, like a wave on the ocean. You know, a wave could emerge from the ocean and travel for miles and miles and be the most incredible, glorious, unique, flowing wave ever. And then eventually it will flow back into the ocean and become nothing. And I see the ego as that as well. And so for me, the interest is in, while we're flowing down the ocean as that wave, um, why not make that wave as beautiful and connected and amazing as possible, but not throwing out the baby with the bathwater and not creating a shadow, kind of a psychedelic shadow, around the ego itself. So that when we trip, we see the ego as an ally and not an enemy. And that's pretty much me, my talk. Thank you. Thanks.